what has been interesting about Ruth to me is that she was in the process of finding her way home. It wasn't a one moment thing, it was a process. And so I would suggest that each one of us here today is in process to finding our way back to the Lord, a closer walk with the Lord, a deeper relationship with Him. So every one of us, we're Ruth. We're Ruth today. And we're finding our way and we're finding love. So here's the theme. The theme of the story is finding your way home. It's kind of like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, remember? She's trying to find her way back home. And the whole time, she had the answer, right? They said, it's the ruby slippers. You know, you just have to close your eyes or whatever, click your heels and say, there's no place like home. There's no place. You will find your way back home. But that was the theme of that story. That's the theme of Ruth. And yet, and it's true. She had the, the path back home all along. And we've looked at it and we've seen it in each person that has shared on this uh, amazing story this, uh, in the book of Ruth is that there was three steps that you took to get back home. You don't have to close your eyes and say, there's no place like home, click, click, click. You don't have to do that, but you do have to take three steps. It's very clear. Step number one is that you have to learn to trust God. If we aren't willing to trust God, we're not on the path back home. Are you, are, am, is that right, right. so right. basic that it's like, yeah, of course. No, but listen, trusting God is hard. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to trust Him because all the stuff around us is going sideways all the time. <laughs> There's so much. And so trusting Him isn't an easy thing. It's everything. You literally can't say, I trust God till you trust God. Trusting God isn't a decision. It's a step. Mm -hmm. You have to step out. And so you're not trusting him until it is hard. You're not trusting him until we go out and have to trust him. And so what I like to say to you is, is the Lord's kind of said to me, Marty, I'll tell you how trust really works. Some people, when it comes down to time to really trust, they leave, but I need you to cleave. So it's this simple. Are you going to cleave when it gets hard or are you going to leave when it gets hard? And so that's what trust is. So she does, Ruth does it, Naomi does it, Boaz does it. All the protagonists in this real life story have to trust him and they do it. And guess what, friends? Guess what we get to do today? If you want to be on the path back home, it's trust time. And it won't be trust time until it's, this is where you say hard, hard. And then we say, bring it on. Because game on. That's what we're here to do. We're not here to have a surface level relationship with the world. Good. We're here to go deep with God. That's step yeah. number one. Step number two is a good step. Because when you step out, you feel so alone. It's so hard. Step number two is connect with people who love me. Hello. Connect with the community. You've got a community connect. You are not alone. And when you step out and there's people who love us, it changes everything. That's the that's second step. But here's how it works for believers. We don't just have to step out into the arms of people who love us. We have to be willing to call people out so we can love them. We've got your back. Come on, here we are. You can trust us to love you. And God says it like this. I am love. And until you love people, you're not putting them in a place to trust me. Yeah. Our ability to love other people is God's unconditional love at work in us. In fact, his love isn't even working at us until we love people who are hard to love. If it's easy to love people, that's favor brokering. That's not unconditional love. I looked it up every time where Jesus commands us to love. It's agape. It's unconditional love. So this isn't, hey, go be nice to people who are nice to you. This is get ready to get dirty. Love people. Mm -hmm. Love them with all your heart. Help them to know how to be able to trust me through the way I've loved you and you can love them. That's what it means to connect with community. And we've seen it. We've seen it in this story. It's real. It's not, this isn't a, like a book of advice. This is a book of how it works. It worked then. It works this way. Now, the number three, if you want to take that third step, remember, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. The third thing of hill clicking or stepping out is that you have to be willing to die to self. 
I, or we, we said, I like this, commune with God, connect with people, and conquer self. Those are the three things. You see the three steps in the book of Ruth. And so to die to self means you have to actually make a cost-benefit analysis where you say, whatever I have, whatever I have a hold of, I'm not going to let it keep me from moving forward with God. In fact, I want to leverage it to bring God to this situation. That's what it means to die to self. And so what I love about dying to self is that I have to sometimes in my cost-benefit analysis, and I, I'm a very basic person, and so I, I need things to be real. That's, that's something about me. I'm, theory doesn't help me too much. I mean, I like theories, but I need to, somebody needs to say, Marty, this is what you do. This is how it works. So here's how it works. God's given us a heavenly reservation if you die to self. It's this simple. Your life or his life. When you choose his life, you step into heaven life. But you've got a reservation. You give your life away. He said, I've reserved for you a place in heaven. In fact, I'm going to go before you and I'm going to build a place for you. You just wait till you get here and see what it looks like. Wow. That's the path you're on. As soon as you die to self, if you hang on to self, he says, then what you've got is a path that leads away from me. And so I look at it this way, and this is how I say, do you want heavenly reservation or do you want human preservation? Because human preservation ends up in true death, forever death. Good. Heavenly reservation yields forever life. Yeah. I'm going one. <laughs> you see how simple that is? And so we have to do that. Look around at the stuff that you have that we've, that we've made important and look at it and see it through God's eyes. And, and leverage it for his kingdom, for his purposes. That's how you want to use yourself up. I uh, lovingly tell my wife all the time, I said, honey, you look like the velveteen rabbit because you just give yourself away. It's like all your fuzz and all these just getting worn <laughs> off. You are, you've allowed so many people to love on you and you've bumped into so many people. It's a beautiful thing. We need to be like the velveteen buddies. Whatever we have of ourselves, give it away. Let it get rubbed off. That's when you've spent your life well. Whatever you don't spend gets wasted. Mm -hmm. So we should spend every self we can on the things that matter forever. That's how it's supposed to work. So that's the plot. The plot is love will win. Love wins. In fact, I like to be able to tell you with quite a high level of confidence that God has loved me at my worst. Mm -hmm. that's, that's when his love works best. And what I want to do with what he's put in me, the love that he's put in me, it's, it's transforming. I am not in a transactional relationship with God. I work my best not to be. I'm not trying to say, if I do this for you, I expect this from you. I just don't. I'm saying, I need your forever love like crazy. And would you pour it out generously? Because I'm a mess. And I can tell you that when you receive of his never ending loving kindness. We've heard this word so many times through the book of Ruth. Kehese. Loving kindnesses. Unwarranted. Mercy. There's not even a right word for it. It changes everything. It's transformational, never transactional. Amen? Amen. So let's go forward and see how it is that we walk in the Kehesed. Because we're going to have a cast. We've seen some of the cast already. Remember Elimelech? So Elimelech was this individual who was married to Naomi. There was a famine. He was a good Jew. He was wealthy. He saw the famine and he said, I'm leaving. I'm going into Moab because I've heard that there's food there and provision. So he goes, he takes his family and it doesn't work out. The Bible said everybody was just doing what was right in their own eyes instead of leaning on the Lord, instead of what? Trusting in God. So he takes the wrong path. He goes there and remember what happens. He dies there, both his sons there and his wife ends up homeless. Isn't that amazing? And so, you know, that's a good warning script for us, that when you're doing the best you can and everything goes sideways, your best is no substitute for God's best, right? And so you, we, we want to take that warning. Elimelech made the wrong choice, and his family paid for it. Some of us are in those situations. I'm, a, I'm in a family that has had to deal with consequences of people making bad choices. All of us are, right? Some of us are in situations where our family has to deal with our bad choices, right? That's a part of it. And so we, we want to learn from that and move back to where we set ourselves up in such a way that we're trusting God to do things that we can't do on our own.
So that was Elimelech, not so good. He's the antagonist, so we don't really want to spend too much time on Elimelech. Then comes the next person, Naomi, his wife. Now, Naomi is like a protagonist-antagonist. So you got a little bit of both going. She's been burned by her husband. She's been, she followed him. She did all the right stuff, and now she's homeless, and she's coming back, and she's got two daughter-in-laws with her. That's all she has. And I love it. And she says, you know, this is so bad. God's been so harsh to me that I'm telling you two daughter-in-laws, go home, don't come, don't follow me anymore. One of them, Orpah, agrees and goes home. And by the way, I did the research. If you do it, uh, scholars will tell you that both Orpah and Ruth were descendants of Eglon, a king of Moab. So they had, they had resources back in Moab. They weren't going back to nothing. They were going back to something, but it was Moab something. And so if you want security, if you want the world, what the world offers, you go back that way. Ruth, remember what Ruth said? Ruth said, no, I'm going with you. And so she gave up all the security she had to follow a Naomi. So I'm saying, I want to tell you this about Naomi. She might have thought that she was bitter. She even named herself bitter. But there was some hope left in her tank. There was some hope left in her tank, and she went right to that spot, and she said, okay, daughter, you come with me, and they did. We're going to get to see Naomi starts getting revved up with that little bit of hope. Can I tell you, friends, a little bit of hope is a whole lot of energy. If you have hope in the right things, it works. That's what I love about Naomi. She had hope, and a little bit of hope left. She gave it to God, and she creates this really cool plan that Liz told us about last week. And I love the plan. It's like a Hollywood script. You know, I'm going to have you get all prettied up. You're going to sneak out in the middle of the night. You're going to profess your love to this Boaz man. And then we're just going to wait and see what happens. You don't just wait and see what happens if you think that you're going to have a good outcome. Hope was in her. She was moving out of bitterness. You know, for a lot of us, that's kind of where we're at. We've been burned. Uh, in my own life, in the last few weeks, I've been burned. I've been burned by people I trusted and with uh, certain areas. It's really hard. And I'd just like to say to you, bitterness didn't creep in. For me, it was disappointment and discouragement. It's just like, good, not. I worked so hard and this is what I get. It was devastating for me. And there was a little bit of hope left. And again, I don't, I don't know how it works. I'm telling you today, I'm so full of hope. I don't even know why I'm full of hope. It's him. And so I don't have room for bitterness. It's too hard out here. Bitterness weighs me down. And so I need to move forward. So that, that's a beautiful thing when we tap into hope. That's Naomi. And then Ruth. I just re want to remind you that uh, Ruth literally gives up everything to go to a new place with a person who's at the worst place in her life. So was she really trying to get something from Naomi? Was she really trying to find her security in Naomi? No, she was trying to give Naomi whatever she had left, which is love and friendship and loyalty. Her name means friend. Mm -hmm. so, so Ruth is going like this. I'm not trying to get something from you, Naomi. I'm believing in what you believe, and I'm bringing my best to you and to your situation. Naomi... I, uh, is at a place of being destitute. Ruth is at a place of destiny. She can choose go back or she can choose to, I'm going to make the most out of this moment regardless. And I just want you to know she chooses. It wasn't chosen for her. When it was right down to it, she made a choice. I'm going for a destiny. I'm going to be Ruth. I'm going to be my name. I'm going to be a loyal friend. I'm going to go make something happen even if it kills me, and it probably will. Wow. That's what she did. We're going to see it in the Scriptures. That's what she brought. And that's why I think we're having a story about her right now. Her name is on this book. There's only two books in the Bible that have the names of women, Esther and Ruth. She, she brought it. And friends, I, I just want to say to you that if you think your destiny is chosen, then you're allowing your situations to define you. Don't be defined by your situations. You choose your destiny, and you tell your situation, you better look out, storm is here. I'm not running from the storm. I am the storm, right? I'm not looking for a friend. I am friend. My name is Ruth. 
That's what she did. And I just want us to tap into that or we're going to miss this story. We're going through hard stuff, but he is in us. Yes. It's God that's in us. It's Holy Spirit. Yes. It's not second rate. I hope you got something going for your stuff. Um, yeah. It's God himself has built his temple in us so that we can walk with him. And so that we can carry out bringing hope to other people and redeeming, which is our next character, Boaz. So now we have this guy named Boaz, and Boaz is wealthy. Boaz is strong. Boaz is a pillar in the community. That's who he is. He's done so many things right for so long that he's got all the right things moving in motion. Isn't it interesting that he's there and he was a relative, a direct relative of Elimelech. Elimelech said, hey, everything's destitute. I better run to Moab. Boaz stayed put and look where he's at. You see the difference? And so Boaz had this thing called faith in God's way. And you're going to see it. Because when he does the redemption, he's going by the book. I just want to say thank you. I've never been a part of a church that loves prayer in the book more than this church. I love this church. We pray like we mean it. The leaders live the word. The people are encouraged by the word. It is a good day to be alive. And it works, friends. Look at Boaz. It works. You, it's not that it's not going to be uh, hard. It's going to be hard, but it works. Yeah. And in the process of it working, we get to come out like a Boaz. Mm -hmm. We get to come out, excuse me, we get to come out strong. We get to come out swift. We get to come out being a difference maker instead of looking for a difference. We are the difference maker. That's who he was, and we're going to see that in a moment. All right. Are we ready to get into the word now? Have I painted enough? Oh, wait. Well, there's one more person that we're going to be introduced to today. He doesn't have a name, but he's the relative. He's called close relative. In Hebrew, it's Gael, Gael, like gal, sort of. And what it actually means is redeemer. His name, in the scripture that we're going to see, if you read it, it would be redeemer. So he's close relative is what it's translated. But if you look up the translation of close relative, it's redeemer, Gael. Mm. Now, can we just pause on that for a moment? The way God sees it, if you're a close relative to somebody, you have to be ready to be the redeemer. You're called redeemer. And I think it's of no small consequence. And I sent uh, Dave Riesinger a text this morning. Because guess what church I'm at? Gael. This church is called Redeem, folks. Our name is we're looking to redeem. We are the close relative to everybody in this community. Hey, we believe in Redeemer. We're here to redeem folks. That's what we do. You might not think you have a family. You've got a family at Redeem. In fact, our name means close relative. And we want to love you right. And we want to be loved by you. Amen. And we want to see you learn to trust God because as you trust God, it increases our trust in God. That's how it really works. We want to be loved by you because when you love us unconditionally, it transforms us. And would you please give us an opportunity to love you because you deserve it. Amen. We want you to receive his love because you're made in his image. You belong to him and we're your family. That's how it works. And anything less than that is less. It's human. It's messed up. It's distorted. But Ruth is laying it out there. And she said, I'm going for that. Mm. Now remember, Boaz was living that. A close relative whose name Redeemer wasn't. That's what we're going to see in the story. So it's just a, you know, a disclaimer that you can have the name and not do the real. So that's what we're going to see today. All right, let's jump into it. First, let's back up a little bit. Ruth, uh, chapter 1, verse 16, which gets us to this place of her choosing a destiny by allowing a Naomi to receive her friendship. It says, Ruth 1, 16, but Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people 
shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. If that's not enough, look what Ruth does after this. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse if anything but death departs you and me. So she doesn't even know the God of Naomi yet, and yet she's calling on that God to witness how well she's going to love Naomi. Amen. That is cooking. <laughs> That's it. That's redeeming right there. I'm giving my life to be with you. I will be your closest relative. I will redeem you, Naomi. I'm not looking for you to redeem me. You don't even have any stuff left to redeem me. You're homeless. Jesus. But what I have is called loyalty, and I'm all in, sink or swim. Here I am, Ruth, Redeemer. Yeah. That's the story, friends. And so Naomi says, all right, if I can kind of tell there's no... You're convinced. Let's go. And so this embarks our story. And then I just want, to see, want you to see in Ruth chapter 3, verse 18, as Naomi says, I'm coming back to life. I'm going to move from Mora and bitterness, and I'm moving back to Naomi. I, I'm moving back to a woman who believes in God and has hope and wants to, wants to see you, Ruth, do well. So guess what Naomi does? Naomi starts coming up with matchmaking opportunities to set Ruth up for success. That's what she does. And she starts working it. And this is what we see in uh, Ruth chapter 3.18. Then Naomi said to Ruth, wait, my daughter, until you know how the matter turns out. Can, you, can we just pause there for a moment? Here's Naomi. Oh, woe is me. Everything's awful and I'm bitter. Don't even call me Naomi anymore because I'm not pleasant. I'm impossible. It's awful. And now she's just a couple chapters later, she's saying, you got to wait. Let's see how this is going to work out. It's going to be better than you ever thought. Can you see the transformation that's taking place? She says, for the man will not rest until he has settled today. Now she's prophesying. <laughs> she's moving from wondering and hoping and bitter. Now she's saying, you just wait, my daughter, because it's about to get good. You think you uncovered his feet? No, you uncovered his heart. He's coming after you. And I know it because I see him seeing you. And that's where she's banking. And can I just tell you, when you and I get na like Naomi and we start seeing the way the Lord sees people, we're going to tell them he's coming after you. Amen. I've seen him seeing you and he's coming after you. I've been at this church and they've been praying. Mm. <laughs> and they've been praying for you and he's coming after you. Thank you, Lord. You think his heart's cold? His heart's not cold. He's looking for you. It might be night. He knows who's touching his feet. He's coming after you. He loves you. He's a redeemer and he's redeeming you. Thank you, Thank you, Jesus. And the drama goes on and it gets to where we are at in. Ruth chapter 4, and I'm just going to go expositorily, if you'll permit me, just to go through the Bible verse by verse at this point. Because this story will carry itself, friends. Yeah. Ruth chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, turn aside, friend. Sit down here. It sounds nice. He's using command form. So for you got to understand, Boaz is the first one to the city gate. He's going to make it happen. Naomi was spot on. And he gets there, and he's waiting for Gael, redeemer, closest relative, to show up. And when he shows up, he's nice. He calls him, hey, friend. But then he says, sit down here. There's business that's going to be done today, and I'm ready to do business. And he turned aside and he sat down. I don't blame him, but I think if I'm Gail, I'm, I think Boaz looks like he's a man on mission at this point. I'm sitting down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and he said, sit down here. So they sat down. I don't know about you, but I like a man who has authority. I just do. He's paid the price to have that. 
He's the first one there. He has character. He does what he says. His name means fleet. He's not just some little ship out there bouncing around in the waves. He's fleet. He is swift. He's to the point. He gets it done. That's his track record. And when he speaks, people are listening. And he can say things in the command form in a polite sense, and they're doing it. And I think it's a wonderful thing that we're honoring people in the military. But when I see people in the military and the armed forces, and he, you know, they carry some swag with them. I want them to, don't you want them to carry some swag with them? I do. I've been in places where I've needed their help. That's a beautiful thing because they have some authority. And this is what Boaz had. He had some authority and he used it for the right reasons. Sit down here. They sit down. Then he said to the closest relative, Gael, he says, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And so I thought to inform you, saying, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, if you will live up to your name, if you will be the closest relative and do what the book says you're supposed to do, if you will redeem it, then redeem it. I'm calling you out. Redeem it. That's what you're supposed to do. In fact, why am I having to tell you to do this? Why am I having to be the go-between for uh, Ruth? Why haven't you already set this in motion? Is it because she's a Moabitess? Is that the problem? <laughs> He's calling him out. Hey, Redeemer, why aren't you redeeming? Your day of dodging and deflecting is over. It's redemption day. And calls him out. But if not, tell me that I may know. And oh, by the way, everybody else here gets to know too. Yeah. For there's no one but you to redeem it. And I am after you. And Gael said, because he's shame, man, I will redeem it. Twist. <laughs> this, this whole story is going wrong now. Wait, Boaz loves Ruth. I mean, he wants her. She's a Moabitess. This was the whole plan. He tells him to redeem it, and the guy actually stands up and becomes a man and does what he's supposed to do. Now he's going to move it in that direction away from Boaz. But the it was the land. I will redeem it. It wasn't Ruth and Moabitess. It was the land. We'll see that. Let's keep going. Ruth 4 through 5 and 6. Then Boaz said, On the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess. You must acquire. I, I wish we knew in Hebrew the beauty of what's happening here. You don't get to buy Ruth, buddy. But you can acquire her. He, same verb, different conjugation form to where it means to acquire instead of buy. Good job, God. Mm -hmm. Ladies, I'm looking at you right now. It's hard to be a person. It's hard to be a woman. It would be hard to be a Ruth the Moabitess from that side of the tracks. Mm -hmm. It's hard. I have three daughters. I have a wife of 40 years. Can I tell you, I'm looking at it firsthand. It's hard to be a woman. It's hard enough just to be a person on planet crazy. <laughs> but to feel like you can be bought and sold, come on. Yeah. And so the beauty of him saying, hey, you need to acquire. It's, it's a significant statement that's being made here. I just want us to acknowledge that. So he says, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. The closest relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself. Wait a minute. You just said you wanted to redeem it. You just said, I will redeem it. But now it equals woman as well. Oh, woman equals Moabitess woman. And now you're going backwards. Now you're going, you can't? How did that can't happen? Can I just tell you the way it works here? Is that when you redeem that land, what you're really doing and is you're redeeming the person who has the right to the land as well. And so now what you're doing is you're saying, I don't want just the land. I want to be able to preserve that family. Mm 
Because family's more important than land. Why? Because you're closest relative. Because you're redeemer. You're not transactional property owner. You're not a brokerage firm. You're here for family. Right. And so now Boaz is reminding him of that. And now Gael, redeemer's going like this. Wait a minute. If I do a cost-benefit analysis of this, this is what it's going to cost me. I can buy that land, and then I'll have to take Ruth. And then she's going to get a descendant, and then she's going to get the land back to give to her descendant. So this is, this is how it would work. Can I make enough money off of that land in the 20 years that I have it to offset the cost that it, I needed to buy it? And in that, will I make enough also to put back into my inheritance for my family? That's, that's all the transactions that were going on. So he's doing this, and he says, I can't do it. I can't make that work. Because I'm going to lose. And then he's also probably going like that. And by the way, it's Ruth the Moabitess. I'm going to lose my reputation. So he's looking at it and he says, no, I cannot. Let's just be truthful. He could have. Come on. He could have redeemed like he's called to redeem, but he doesn't. I don't blame him because how many times have I not lived up to an opportunity I could have had to make a difference? Right? Are we in the same family? There's been so many times where if I would have just stayed the course, no telling how much beautiful redemption would have taken place. But because I got off course, somebody else had to redeem me and put me back on course. So, but let's not, let's not lie about it. Let's not lie and say, oh yeah, it just wasn't a good, good day for him. No, he, made, he looked at it and he made it a bad day. We have choice, individuals. We all have choices. And today's the day to make a choice to be like Boaz. And get on to redeeming. All right. I almost sounded southern there, didn't I? You have to admit, I grew up in Houston for 12 years. It sneaks in every now and then. I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Can you hear that? Mm -hmm. Redeem it for yourself. You may have my right of redemption. Again, he lies, for I cannot redeem it. What you see sometimes is what you get. Mm -hmm. Ruth 4, 7 to 9. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and he gave it to another and this was the matter of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself and he removed his sandal. This is so weird. God. <laughs> so he goes, you know what? I'm admitting I'm not going to buy it. You get to have it. Here's my shoe. <laughs> now, this is what I like about it. All right. Can you imagine desert land, dirt land, hopping home on a one sandal foot? <laughs> That's embarrassing. I mean, I just got, I'm kind of almost in a bad way, kind of glad that Gael got to, had to lose his shoe and hop on home with one foot. <laughs> and I think that the Jews did it that way on purpose. It, it, it was a way of saying you didn't live up to your right to redemption. Okay. It's going to cost you something. So you thought it would jeopardize your reputation. You thought it would jeopardize your money. Look how you look right now hopping on one foot. Your reputation is not so great. I'm acknowledging this very day that the Lord doesn't want Marty Schaefer to hop on one foot. That the Lord's given me opportunities to jeopardize some of the money I have, to jeopardize some of my comforts, and of course, to jeopardize this reputation, with it, which isn't that much anyway, <coughs> on behalf of giving something of value to another person. And that other person may not even see it in themselves yet, but I get to say, man, I'm telling you what, I want you. You come be a part of my family, because I see you as belonging to the Lord, and we're family. That's redemption. That's what he's calling us to do. And if we give that up, we should have to hop a little bit, right? Let's pay the price. So now I'm looking at it, and I know you agree with me, because I you guys can't see this, because I get to see it from here, but you're like going, you're nodding your head. So I you're just nodding, yeah, it's true. What he's saying is true, right? And some of you are going, yeah, I'll just stop now, mister. But what I'm saying is true. We're called to be in God's family business of redeeming people to his family. That's our calling. That's what we're called. I can prove it to you over and over. We've had this thing that's called the Great Commission. Go to all the world, right? That's what he said. 
Go and be my witnesses. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It's from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. Abraham, I want to bless you so that you can do what? Bless all nations for all time. I'm redeeming others through you. That's how it works. Now, we're not the ones who do the work of redemption. Jesus did. We're the witnesses. We call it out. We tell somebody, you are were so loved by an everlasting God that he died for you. I loved our songs this morning. I'm looking around for a Susan worship team. Oh my gosh. Hey, that, that cave is empty, folks. Do you know that he was born in a cave? That manger was in a little carved out cave area. And then he died in a cave and both are as empty as empty can be. The cave isn't holding them. He's out of the cave and he's looking for people to be redeemed. Amen. And guess what? He put his spirit in us so that we get to look to. That's what we do. We're testimonies of it. So it's going to cost us something. We're going to have to get out of our little caves. We're going to get out of our safe spaces. We're going to have to jeopardize some stuff. But we carry an opportunity to save your family. I love you. I need you. And this is what I just want to tell you. Is that for me, it's very simple. We kind of make it hard but I want to be very accurate with you. It's simple. Here's the message. God's name is Yahweh. That means everlasting God. That's what it means. If you want to get right down in Hebrew, it means I am everlasting to everlasting. Yes. Now look, I'm admitting that's hard for me to understand. How do you go from everlasting to everlasting? You just always are everlasting, all right? So he's beyond me. I get that, but I know who he is. He's forever. He's most high God. He's it. So he's eternal. Friends, I've, I've studied this. You've studied it. You look at the laws of physics and thermodynamics. Number one is that matter never ceases to exist. That means that matter is eternal. That means that all things have matter. Where does eternity come from? It comes from him. Every substance known has an eternal element to it because it comes from him. Just tell the truth. It's already there. We believe there's an everlasting eternal God. That's number one. That's how simple it is. Number two is that he says he is love, agape, unconditional love. That's who our father is. That's the family. And we are doing our best to love others unconditionally because we've tasted of it and it is amazing. Yeah. We're not perfect at it, but we receive it. Amen. And it transforms us. And we want to be able to call you to be able to live like this in his love. Just don't try to get right with eternity. Walk in his love. And then number three, if he loves us this much, don't you think he'll forgive you? Amen. Don't you think forgiveness just reigns like it does in the Northwest? <laughs> I mean, it's just, if you get close to God, forgiveness is everywhere. So why would you resist him? He knows we're but mere humans trying to figure it out. He's trying to do what? Redeem us. So we're the ones who get to say it. Now we'll just go to the end of the message. And nice people who close. I'm not sure who it is today, but if we want to come close, we're there. Oh, gosh. I'm so sorry. Ruth 4.10. He's going to say, moreover, this is Boaz. He says, moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess. So you remember, he's saying to this, a guy who's lost his sandal, right? So he's talking to Sandal Hopper. He says, now, look, I got the land, but I also want you to know, and he, he says this, that I acquired Ruth the Moabitess. Now, remember what Naomi said? Go watch, because he's going to figure it out today. You know Ruth is in there being seen right now. He's being, he's being pretty proud about who he's calling out. Yeah, I bought the land, I redeemed, and I'm looking right now, and look, she's mine. Ruth, Moabitess, you belong to me. I've redeemed you. What a beautiful thing. Feels so good to be redeemed. I've redeemed Ruth, Moabite. The widow of 
Mahon to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are my witnesses today. I'm standing here before you, friends, and there's a great cloud of witnesses in heaven of every believer who's gone before us. They're watching this moment. We didn't get here alone. Eternity's watching. Eternity's calling. Be redeemed. Be a redeemer. Boaz saw it. Boaz moved on it. Boaz called it out. Here's the beauty of what happens when you do that. If we go on, I call this the mo, more ever moment. Because the Ruth 4 began with, more, moreover, I have done this. You think I've just redeemed? No, I'm going to tell you, this is a moreover moment. Something very significant has happened this day. Write a book, it's good. And they did. And he goes on, look at the next passage. Ruth 4, 11 and 12. And all the people who were in the court, it's not really a court, they're just sitting around like a bunch of people in a church in the lobby. Said, we are witnesses. We see it. We see what you've done. We see Ruth and Moab by the Spirit Storm. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah. Not only do we see her, now we see her as somebody. We see her as a future promise. We see her like the great women of old. We see. We see what it's like to redeem both of whom built the house I can't even of Israel and may you achieve wealth in Ephrata and become famous in Bethlehem now watch this more over may your house be like the house of Perez and Tamar bore to Judah for through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this Moabitess? No, this beautiful young woman. The people started prophesying because Boaz saw it. He did his part. It changed everything. The community started seeing people like Jesus sees people. This is what it means to be redeemed, a house of redemption. This is who we are. This is why Dave Riesinger gave this church the name Redeem. This is why we are loyal to God today as a family. And we are the young woman. And we're a witness of the beauty of God. We're his witnesses. And we have this beautiful privilege to call it out in others. Sometimes we have to see it before they see it. And that puts them on a step of what? Trusting God. But they're not going to fall because number two, they're connected to a community who loves them. We're here, number two. And number three, we're going to say, and now it's conquer yourself, die to yourself. If you have something of value, give it away while you still have time. That's the path we're on. That's Ruth. And I can't wait for next week because we're going to see what God did with this offspring. Next week, friends, you're going to see what God does when he gets a hold of a life. But today, I just want to close with this. And uh, 
If you've not said yes to the Lord, I just don't get it. I really don't. Today's the day to choose. Choose your destiny. Step out. Come on. Step into a relationship of faith with him this day. I'm asking you to step into his arms. Trust him. I don't blame you. Trusting is hard. I'm standing up here telling you today that I've trusted him. Right now, I'm in a really hard spot. But I've got a bunch of people on my side and in my corner, and I'm going to be just fine. Step out. Trust him. And for those of us who in the body who somehow... We got Naomi-ized, and we got a little bitter, and we got a little on the outside looking in. Let's start scheming again of how people can get redeemed. Let's start matchmaking. That's what I'm asking you to do.